The Midra 4K family of products have been designed to meet the needs of small to medium sized fixed installations and live environments requiring the most reliability, the best image quality, and state of the art 4K processing features. In this video, I'll stay away from sales and marketing lingo and overlook many of the features, buttons, and possibilities that are available on Midra 4K devices. Instead, I'll be focusing on the essential functions needed to go from a unit that's just been removed from its shipping container to a unit that's passing video. In front of me, I have an Icos 4K that's fresh out of the box. There are other models in the Midra 4K family of products, and regardless of which unit you have, you'll find the configuration and operation to be the same, although there are differences in features between the different models. I'll begin by connecting the power cord and turning on the power switch. It takes the unit roughly 45 seconds to boot up, and I'll speed through the process. Now that it's booted, I'll factory reset the device to make sure I'm starting from a known state. Using the front panel, I'll go to Control, Factory Reset, and confirm that I want to reset the device. This will cause the unit to reboot, and once it's done, I'll update the firmware. To obtain the firmware, I'll come to Analogway's website, navigate to a Midra 4K device, click Downloads, Firmware and Remote Control Software, and click the current firmware version to download it. After the firmware has downloaded, you'll need to extract it. Place the extracted file onto a USB drive. And insert the drive into the front panel and follow the on-screen prompts. The update process may take up to 15 minutes, but it's usually much shorter. I'll speed through the update process, which ends with the device rebooting. Now that the firmware is up to date, I'll set the unit's IP address. Using the front panel, I'll go to Control, Connection, I'll select IPv4 due to the requirements of my network, and I'll set the IP address as needed. Now that the address has been set, I'll need to scroll to the bottom of the menu and choose Apply. Now it's time to connect my input, output, and network cables. With analog way products, the inputs are always bordered in gray, the outputs are bordered in black, and each input and output includes a signal status LED to confirm whether the connector is receiving or sending a signal. Now that my cables are connected, it's time to begin configuring the device, and I'll do so using WebRCS. WebRCS is the unit's embedded control application. To access it, I'll first need to make sure that the network settings of the Midra 4K device and my PC are set correctly. Then I'll find the unit's IP address from the front panel, and I'll key that in to my web browser of choice. Now that the WebRCS has loaded, I'll find the main navigation tabs at the left. The interface is divided into two main sections, the Live and Setup sections. As an example, let's say we're powering a 4K LED wall and a 1080p recorder that records what's being shown on the LED wall. To set this up, we'll head to the Setup, Reconfig, Screens and Aux tab. I'm going to use this page to set the operating mode of my device. The operating modes available will depend on which Midra 4K model you have. If I choose Mixer mode, the first output will be a screen output, and the second output will become a scaled aux that can show a copy of any input or screen at up to 1080p. 
I could also choose matrix mode, which gives me two independent screen outputs. The Icos 4K also has a horizontal blend and vertical blend mode, allowing you to combine the outputs to drive a very wide or a very tall screen and configure edge blending if needed. Since our example calls for a 4K LED screen and a copy of what's on the LED screen to be sent to a 1080p recorder, I'll select mixer mode. Different models of Midra 4K devices also have different available layer quantities and the layer quantity is affected by the operating mode chosen as well as whether the screen has mixer or split layers. If I assign split layers, I have double the number of live layers available. However, the layers cannot crossfade, which is something that can be configured to be hardly noticeable. All layers have a Z order or visual priority. The background layer is always the bottommost layer. The live layers are displayed on top of the background. And the foreground layer is always at the top and displayed over any content assigned to the other layers. If I've made any changes on this page, I'll need to click the apply button before they take effect. Now let's come to the pre-config audio tab to configure how audio will be handled. For each screen, I could choose direct routing or follow the audio layer, which gives me the option to choose which audio source will be routed on the live screens page. I can choose to have the audio follow a layer and set which layer it follows back on the live screens page. Or I can set the audio based on the output instead of the screen, choosing none to not pass any audio or direct routing to choose which input's audio is routed to the output. Now it's time to set the output resolution and rate. To do this, come to the setup outputs tab. The first page displays a snapshot of what each output is currently sending, and to configure one of the outputs, click on it. I need to set this output to a 4K resolution, and to do so, I'll choose the format drop-down box and select the appropriate signal. I can use the signal tab to set the signal parameters for this output such as the color space and whether the output is HDCP compliant. The pattern tab allows me to display an output test pattern and I can manipulate the color using the adjustments tab. I'll hover over the second output on the virtual rear panel and I can see that the output is already sending 1920 by 1080 so I won't need to make any changes to the resolution I'm sending. Using the virtual rear panel, you can click any connector to enter its setup page. Now we'll take a look at setting up an input. On the left, I'll choose the Inputs tab and select the input I want to modify. From this page, if the input has multiple input plugs like numbers 1 and 2, I'll need to select which one I'm using. I can also set up other input parameters such as HDCP compliance, make color adjustments, apply a crop to the input, or configure key. Next, we'll go to the Library tab, which is where we upload still images to the unit. On this page, you can drag an image or a folder of images into this box and click the Upload Images button to store them on the device. You can also click this box to open Explorer and choose the images you'd like to upload. Once the images are uploaded to the device, you'll need to assign them to an image slot before they can be displayed on the output so we'll head to the Images tab. This tab shows us the image slots. There are four foreground image slots and four background image slots, and only the images assigned to these slots are available to be displayed on the outputs. To assign images, I'll click on a slot and select one of the images from the library. Now that I've done this, the foreground images are ready to be used on the outputs, but there's one more step before I can use the background images. On the pre-config backgrounds tab, for each screen that's not an aux screen, you'll find eight background sets, which is essentially a look that can be displayed in the background layer. I'll choose a background set 
and assign a source to it by click and drag. The Icos 4K supports both live input and still image backgrounds, but the other mid 4K models are still image backgrounds only. You'll find that the background layer is scaled, which is different from how some of our other products work. Now that I've gone through the basic setup, I'm ready to start sending content to my outputs, so we'll come back to the live screens page. Towards the left of this page, you'll find the source selection. The first tab gives me access to all of my inputs. The next tab shows the foreground images. The third tab allows me to send a copy of what's on the screen to my aux screen. And the last tab displays the background sets. Towards the center of the page, you'll find all of the screens and aux screens. All screen types have two states, program and preview. Preview is displayed at the bottom, and your audience doesn't see what's displayed in preview. Because of this, and to maintain seamless switching and transition effects, you should always create and edit your looks in preview. Above preview, you'll find the program state, and what's displayed on program is what's visible to your audience. Let's start by creating the first look of the day, which is an introduction video playing on the LED wall and the client's logo displayed in the bottom right corner of the screen. To make this happen, I'll choose the Inputs tab, find the correct source, and drag it to a layer. Notice I can't place this source into the background or foreground layer. Inputs can only be assigned to the live layers. To make the source full screen, I could click and drag it. I could also come to the properties for this layer and manually enter the size and position or I can use the shortcut toolbar at the bottom of the screen. Next, I'll bring in the client's logo by choosing the foreground images tab, find the logo and drag it to the foreground image layer, and then position the layer as needed. With the foreground layer, as well as the background layer, it's not possible to resize the content. For my second output, which is an aux screen feeding a recorder, we said that it should send a copy of what's on the LED wall. I'll come to my Screen Source Selection tab, find the screen's program, and drag it to the aux screen. Once the look is as needed, I'm ready for my audience to see it, and I'll come to the Transition section on the right. The first thing I'll need to pay attention to is which screens are armed. If the screen is blue, it's currently armed, which means that it will be affected by a transition. To execute the transition, I have a take button, which executes a seamless transition in the amount of time specified in this box, using any transition effects that have been configured in the Properties tab. There's also a virtual T-bar, which allows me to manually control the transition speed, as well as a cut button which executes a seamless cut without any transition effects. Rather than building each look manually every time you need it, you can speed up the process using memories. We'll focus on screen memories first. Most often, screen memories are used to save a complete copy of a look. For example, if I want to save this introduction look I've created, I'll click the Save button, choose whether I want to save from Program or Preview, Choose which screen I want to save from, and then I'll select the memory number I want to save to, and I'll give it a label and a color, and click Save. Next, I'll save a memory for the look that's on the aux screen. I'll come to the aux memories tab, choose Save, and repeat the same process as with my screen memories. Now that I've saved my memories, I'll clear what's currently on screen by selecting each layer and pressing delete on my keyboard. And when I'm ready to use the intro look again, I'll need to load screen memory one to screen one and aux memory one to aux one. I can simplify and speed up the memory loading process by saving a master memory. A master memory is a macro that can recall multiple screen or aux memories to different screens at the same time. To save the introduction look, I'll choose Master Memories, click Save, and tell the unit how I want to save the memory. 
Since I've already saved the look on the screen and aux screen as a memory, I'll choose to use existing screen and aux memories. What I'm saying here is when I recall master memory one, on screen one, load screen memory one, and on aux one, load aux memory number one. Now I'll make sure that I'm saving to the correct memory number, assign a label, and click save. Once again, I'll clear out what's currently displayed on my screens. When I need the introduction look again, I can recall it by loading a single master memory instead of one screen memory and one aux memory. The last thing we'll take a look at is the multi-viewer. It's controlled from the live multi-viewer page. The multi-viewer displays content in what's called a widget. A widget can display any input, a copy of one of the three internally generated timers, countdowns or clocks, or a copy of a screen's preview or program state. Right now, I don't have any widgets visible, but I'll change that by selecting a widget from the top and enabling it in the properties tab. If you need a look that includes multiple widgets, you may find it easier to use the layout builder to create the layout you need. Each widget can be individually resized and repositioned, but they can't be overlapped. If the widgets are overlapped, you won't be able to see the content assigned to the overlapped widgets. You assign sources to widgets with click and drag, just like when assigning sources to screens, or you can select the source property and choose a source from the dropdown. After creating a multi-viewer layout you like, you can save it as a memory by coming to the Memories tab, clicking Save, selecting a memory number to save to, give it a label, and click the Save button. Now that the memory is saved, it would be quick and easy to get back to the saved look by dragging the memory to the multi-viewer.